morning. Let's get underway. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody back to a uh, new academic year of Grand Rounds. It's a pleasure to see everybody here. Congratulate all of you on finding your way to D209 instead of our usual digs. We'll be here for three weeks because of some work going on in the room that we normally use. So keep that in mind. I had to get reminded by my staff this morning where I was going. And um, so, again, welcome to everybody for another uh, great year of Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We're uh, going to have our speaker, Jeet LeMay, this morning introduced by Mike Linnaeus, who's one of our um, inpatient chief residents here at UWMC. They've started, as you probably know, at the end of June. Uh, Linnea Mills is the other inpatient chief. She's at a house staff retreat uh, today, and she, the two of them will be doing the introductions, most of the introductions for our speakers at Ground Rounds over the year as normally. Mike was, uh, say a few words about him first. Born in California, grew up in southern Washington State, battleground across the river from Portland, and went to Gonzaga in Spokane where he graduated summa cum laude in chemistry um, with several awards. Went on to Northwestern where he um, earned his MD and PhD degrees, um, PhD studying ion channels and drug effects, uh, several papers, many presentations, one paper including a first author paper in Nature on um, ion channels and drug mechanisms. He um, got one of the prestigious NIH Ruth Kirstein Awards for his support there. And uh, as well as the Outstanding MD-PhD Student Award for the Northwestern Program. He uh, may have set a new indoor record of finishing his PhD in three years and uh, got some uh, commendations for that, including perhaps from his wife. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> he's been terrific in our residency program, uh, has excelled on, on all fronts, and we were delighted to sign him up to be one of our chief residents here this year. I had the pleasure of meeting his wife, Sarah, and his daughters, uh, Claire and Sonia, at our beach place a couple of weeks ago. A delightful uh, family, as well as his other accomplishments. Uh, during his research time as his chief resident, he's going to be working with Bill Catterall, who's an ion channel uh, world expert, who's the chair of the pharmacology department here. So, Mike, without further ado, come on up and introduce Lajit. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bremner, for that wonderful introduction. I um, can tell that my, uh, my wife and kids like the beach place. Um, we're, uh, we're lucky to have Dr. LeMay today for Grand Rounds. Uh, Dr. LeMay is a well-known educator and scholar in the field of infectious disease. Graduated Phi Beta Kappa from UW for undergrad before doing NIH uh, Howard Hughes Research Fellowship. I then returned after that to UW for med school and left again for residency in Boston at the MGH. I returned for a final time for dual fellowships in laboratory medicine and infectious disease. He's since been here and remained an integral part of the ID and microbiology community. He's an important clinical teacher here, working with medical students, residents, and fellows in multiple arenas, and many of you have probably had the chance to meet him working on consult services or in his work as a, as a consultant in infectious disease. Over the years, he's developed expertise and an international reputation in the area of transplant infectious disease, and his list of over 100 publications includes multiple articles on transplant-related diseases. He's received numerous research grants and many awards, including the Fialco Scholar Award in 2005 for his research in this area. He, spe he specifically focused much of his research on CMV, and his talk today is entitled CMV in ICU Patients, Hidden Pathogen or Innocent Bystander. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming, and thanks for that kind int introduction. It really is a pleasure to be here and have the chance to address uh, friends and colleagues, uh, faculty members, uh, valued family members, including my son, Nishant, my uh, daughter, Mira. Um, I'm sure we can. All right, how's that? Is that better? No. Is that better? No. A little help from the technical booth, please. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. All right, I'll try and speak up. 
So as I mentioned, pleasure to be here and, and have the chance to present our work uh, to all of you as, as members of the academic community and, and uh, close, <clears throat> close family members uh, as, as well. My son Nishant, my daughter Mira, and my wife Vani, who came under a little bit of duress but under the promise of donuts, which hopefully they're enjoying now. Um, you know, it's particularly exciting for us to have the opportunity to share our work in the area uh, of cytomegalovirus, and my colleague, uh, close collaborator Michael Book and I have been working in the area of cytomegalovirus, but almost exclusively in the setting of immunocompromise and in transplantation. And so it's very exciting for us to just think about the possibilities that this very well-established pathogen in immunosuppressed patients might actually play a much broader role far beyond uh, the walls of this small population of immunosuppressed patients, such as recipients of, of transplants. So what I'd like to do today during uh, the talk is to cover with you the available data, as well as our work that focuses on cytomegalovirus's role in the uh, setting of critical illness without overt uh, immunosuppression, and to try and tease, a, uh, tease apart the available data on whether CMV in the ICU setting represents a dangerous hidden pathogen that's overlooked for, for various reasons, or whether it's simply an innocent bystander. And I think the font size is, is no mistake uh, here. This should give you some uh, clue about my biases, but uh, I'll let you come to your own conclusions after presenting the data. My disclosures are shown here. So as most of you as clinicians are well aware, cytomegalovirus is one of the single most important viral pathogens in a variety of immunosuppressed hosts, including transplant recipients, solid organ transplant, stem cell transplant, HIV, a number of other classical immunosuppressed settings. But it's really only been over the last few years that there's been an appreciation and an understanding that cytomegalovirus might potentially play a role in a much broader role in populations beyond immunosuppressed patients. There's some very provocative epidemiologic studies that have been published just within the last few years linking CMV prior exposure with an increased risk of mortality in elderly adults living in the community to uh, a broader range of persons of all ages representative of the United States population done through a study uh, analyzing data from the NHANES cohort. And then finally, the area that I want to focus on today is the uh, critically ill population of patients who don't have uh, exogenous immunosuppression. And this accounts for a very large uh, patient population relative to the population one thinks about and uh, who are classically immunosuppressed. And interestingly, the data linking CMV with uh, various adverse outcomes has been seen in critically ill patients who have had a variety of injuries, ranging from sepsis to trauma, severe burns, as well as acute myocardial infarction. And among these various etiologies for critical illness, there's no question that sepsis plays a particularly large role. And in fact, the financial impact, societal impact, and, and obviously the impact on individual patients and families is very substantial, despite what we would consider to be state-of-the-art care. And unfortunately, despite intensive investigations, there have been very few successful tried and true interventions to date. And unfortunately, we've been left with a long list of failures that looked promising in vitro preclinical, but unfortunately didn't stand the test of careful clinical trials. Not all is lost, however. There have been some interventions that I think most intensivists would agree probably are truly beneficial and should be accepted as part of standard care as listed here, but clearly with the magnitude of the problem, the unmet need, newer paradigms to think about why it is that some people do well, others don't do well uh, with critical illness is, is very important. And whatever these new paradigms are, they need to consider just the heterogeneity of the population, all of whom might be diagnosed with the same clinical illness of sepsis or severe sepsis, for example, and they must take into consideration that multiple mechanisms, mediators, and pathways, rather than a single molecule, are probably going to, are perturbed and may need to be targeted to ultimately improve the outcome of, of these patients. And, and there's some very tantalizing data that cytomegalovirus might, in fact, provide some links or fit with, with some of these issues uh, in the paradigms that, that I'm talking about. So what I'd like to do with you is turn you all into card-carrying CMV virologists in five to seven minutes. 
um, at least what you need to know that's uh, relevant for any discussion about cytomegalovirus in the intensive care unit. I'll review with you what the available data are on CMV infection in ICU patients with a focus on how common is it um, to reactivate or have CMV infection in the ICU. Can we predict who's going to develop CMV reactivation or not? And ultimately, other than mortality, what are the adverse clinical outcomes with which CMV has been linked in this setting? And then I'll turn next to trying to identify if this link between CMV and adverse outcomes, this epidemiologic link is true, which the punchline is that we still don't know, um, what are biologically plausible mechanisms through which active CMV replication could potentially cause these adverse outcomes? That might get us closer to uh, understanding whether, whether this is truly a, a mechanistic uh, clinical link. And then finally, I'll um, show you what our group is doing to help clarify the role that CMV might play or not play in ICU patients and focus specifically on the GRAIL study, which uh, many of you who take care of transplant or uh, ICU patients might actually be uh, getting a call from our, our study team. And that is the uh, gancyclovir for preventing reactivation in patients with acute injury of the lung. I take no claim for that acronym. Um, so here's the primer part, five minutes card-carrying CMV virologist. Um, CMV is a member of the herpes virus family that includes a number of uh, viruses, including some that are probably much more familiar to you, such as herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus, the etiologic agent of chickenpox or shingles, Epstein-Barr virus, one of the etiologies of uh, mononucleosis, and CMV is in that same family. It's a double-stranded DNA virus, and one of the key features that you need to know is once you acquire primary infection by one or uh, more of these routes that are shown here, the old adage becomes very true, once you're a friend, you're a friend for life. There's no known way that the hosts for these uh, human herpes viruses can actually eradicate the virus from the body after infection has occurred. And in fact, in the majority of persons, primary infection is asymptomatic, unrecognized, controlled by the host, and then the virus re retains lifelong persistence in a state called latency, where the viral DNA is present, but active viral replication is not occurring. And in fact, the only marker that a person has been previously exposed, infected, and has the virus for life is the presence of antibodies to the virus. Uh, it turns out that there are many, many ways to acquire CMV, all of which require close personal contact through some of the, uh, any of the means that are shown here. And the question comes up, how common is it for us to be infected with CMV? Are there any estimates in this, in this room? Well, it turns out it's extremely common. And uh, if we live long enough, these are data from NHANES showing a very um, uh, significant increase that's directly age-related. And although there's some differences in ethnicity, socioeconomic status, if we live long enough, we will become infected with CMV. So yet another thing to look forward to as we, as we get older. And in the vast majority of these persons, they would not recall any clinical illness compatible with CMV. So CMV infection is very common, and the usual number that's uh, estimated in adults is somewhere around 50 to 70% of us have been previously exposed and infected. As a prototypical uh, human herpes virus, the virus uh, uh, maintains latency. And during that period, active viral replication is not actually occurring, and there's only limited gene expression, and the virus is thought to be under strict uh, control through the cellular immune uh, arm. And, and importantly, the virus is not detectable by conventional tests that you and I use to diagnose patients with CMV-associated uh, clinical syndromes. And as I mentioned before, the only way that you would know that someone has previously been exposed and infected with CMV is that their blood will have antibodies to various CMV proteins or a CMV serology. The other important feature about herpes virus is this um, concept of reactivation. So since the ma vast majority have been exposed, have the virus latent in our systems, there are a number of uh, factors that can lead uh, latency to progress to full-blown active viral replication. 
And importantly, when there's active viral replication, it can be clinically apparent, as we might diagnose in an immunosuppressed patient with CMV pneumonia, CMV hepatitis, et cetera, or entirely subclinical, yet active viral replication can be detected by one or more of the diagnostic tests that we use, again, to diagnose clinical CMV syndromes. A number of stimuli that are known to reactivate CMV from latency to full-blown active viral replication have been described, and two that are particularly relevant to the ICU setting are bacterial infection and catecholamines. And in animal studies and in human studies, several specific mediators can very efficiently reactivate CMV from latency into a state of full-blown active viral replication. Um, in this uh, overview from Jay Fishman that focuses on transplant, I, I put this here only to emphasize that active CMV infection, whether it's from reactivation of latent infection or new primary infection, really can have a very broad array of effects. And although we're used to thinking in the immunosuppressed population specifically of the so-called direct effects of CMV, which are the clinical syndromes associated with high-grade CMV replication, there are probably some very important so-called indirect effects that are also uh, mediated by CMV but might not be clinically apparent in the way we think about active clinical um, or CMV disease-related symptoms. And the direct effects of CMV are either viral syndrome, a febrile illness with uh, leukopenia, uh, hematologic abnormalities, or tissue invasive disease of virtually any organ in the body with involvement of the lung being particularly common and uh, but virtually any tissue or organ can be involved and these are the syndromes that more commonly occur in immunocompromised patients recipients of stem cells solid organ transplants etc and again the pathogenesis here is thought to be related to the tissue injury that results from high grade viral replication um, uh, or, and the associated host response. And one of the key features about the direct effects of CMV are that they are intimately linked to viral load. So there is a very strong association such that the higher the viral load, the higher the probability that the person has disease or will develop disease unless that viral load is decreased. In contrast, the so-called indirect or uh, cellular effects of CMV are not mediated through high-grade viral replication. In fact, they seem to be independent of viral load altogether, and some of these effects have been found even in patients who have never developed clinical evidence of CMV disease and has occurred, again, with subclinical infection. And some of the uh, specific uh, indirect effects that have been linked primarily epidemiologically to um, cytomegalovirus and uh, subclinical infection have included a state of immunosuppression that might increase the risk of secondary infections, uh, enhancement of certain inflammatory pathways, and then through ill-described uh, 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 mechanisms that um, are associated with an increased risk of mortality in patients who are seropositive or in the transplant setting receive an organ from a donor who's CMV seropositive. And again, the mechanisms for these associations have not been uh, fully elucidated. Some of the candidates um, to explain these mechanisms are listed here, but far from, from uh, completely defined. So that's your primer on CMV. You're all CMV virologists. Now, what about CMV in the ICU setting? How common is it, and what are the risk factors for um, developing active CMV infection? Fortuitively, uh, fortuitously, there was a very nice review by Andre Khalil and Diana Florescu that was published just a few years ago that looked at all studies published to that time that tried to uh, determine what the rate of active CMV infection, so full-blown viral, viral replication that could be detected by culture, PCR, other methods, and found that the overall rate, again, there was quite a bit of heterogeneity within these studies, that's why they've shown the data as they have, that the uh, rate of active CMV replication was about 20% overall. And when they uh, further stratified these studies, according to whether they looked at the actual serology of the patient before they followed them for the um, evidence of active CMV replication, or whether they included only patients who were CMV seropositive, means they'd previously been exposed, lifelong infection, and therefore at risk for reactivation, 
they found some pretty substantial differences such that almost all of the patients who had CMV reactivation or active infection were previously CMV seropositive. And so this is very compelling data that the active CMV that we detect in these patients is likely the manifestation of reactivated infection rather than acquiring primary infection through blood transfusions, um, other forms of contact in the ICU that uh, probably are, are not valid here. Um, in addition, they found that the more sensitive the diagnostic method that was used, the greater the predicted uh, rates of active CMV infection. And so using PCR or antigen-based assays compared to less sensitive methods would lead to higher estimates of CMV infection. And perhaps the most interesting and provocative findings of their study, meta-analysis, was uh, is shown in this slide where they looked at, again, the epidemiologic association between active CMV infection and, in this case, all-cause mortality. Now, remember, these are quite heterogeneous studies, some surgical intensive care units, some medical intensive care unit. So a number of uh, factors are at play here. But at the end of the day, within the limitations of this meta-analysis, they found that active CMV infection uh, was associated with a two-fold increased risk of all-cause mortality in a range of critically ill patients. In addition, um, there have also been a number of other adverse clinical outcomes that have been specifically linked to active CMV infection, such as increased length of hospital and ICU stay, an increased duration of mechanical ventilation, and increased nosocomial infections. And all of these could potentially be linked mechanistically to what we know about CMV in non-ICU patients or, or in uh, patients with classic immunosuppression. Now, clearly, there are some very important limitations of this work, and I've just listed a few of them. Each of the studies by themselves was relatively small in size. They had uh, very selected uh, ICU populations. They often used non-quantitative CMV methods. Um, one of the real concerns from a bias perspective is they used non-blinded assessment of clinical endpoints like length of stay, et cetera. Number of uh, statistical issues at play, and at the end of the day, no observational study, in my view, could establish definitively causality. So these are the limitations. So to address at least in part some of these limitations, our group, uh, my uh, collaborator and, and co-principal investigator on the GRAIL trial, Michael Burke, and I uh, conducted a prospective two-center observational study at Harborview and at UW where we prospectively studied CMV seropositive, since I showed you the data that what we're looking at is reactivation, uh, adults who were immunocompetent, so if they had any exogenous immunosuppression, HIV, uh, immunomodulator therapy, et cetera, they were excluded, and um, it took patients who developed critical illness to a, um, in response to a broad range of insults as shown here, and then did twice weekly CMV PCRs until death or hospital discharge and then monitored for clinical events in a blinded uh, fashion to try and reduce the biases that were inherent in some of the previous studies. And the primary endpoint, which was defined based on preliminary data, was death or continued hospitalization by day 30, based on what we predicted or what we anticipated the effect of CMV might be, and used a number of statistical approaches to adjust for confounders and also to try and assess in various ways any link between CMV and the adverse outcomes that we anticipated finding. And the uh, data are summarized here for the study population. There were overall 120 patients, uh, 20 each in patients with severe burn injury or acute myocardial infarction, 40 in the patients uh, in the MICU with severe sepsis, and 40 who developed uh, severe trauma. And although you'll see there are a number of differences between the various groups, the key points are that these patients in general were relatively ill, had median Apache scores of 21 as a severity of illness score. Uh, these patients, the majority, were mechanically ventilated at the time of uh, um, enrollment. Uh, and importantly, a significant proportion, almost 35% of patients, developed one or more of the endpoints uh, or the outcomes that were included in the primary endpoint of the study, allowing us some uh, leeway statistically to be able to assess any association with CMV. So how common was it using these rigorous methods to detect CMV in these patients? Well, what we found was that 
CMV at any level, so having a positive PCR uh, in blood, detecting CMV DNA in blood, which would never be detected in an otherwise healthy person, was found in a third of patients. And although there were significant differences between the various units, um, we also found that nearly 20% of patients developed what we defined as high-grade viremia, which in the setting of transplantation has a very close association with tissue invasive disease and clinical syndromes due to CMV. And these um, patients develop CMV viremia at a median of 12 days after admission to the ICU. And this viremia was not just a blip or transient, but in fact, the median duration of viremia was almost 17 days in this cohort. And when we look at these data graphically, um, stratified uh, CMV viremia at any level, stratified by burn, uh, cardiac, uh, medical, or trauma ICU, the patterns are really quite similar, except that the patients with acute myocardial infarction had overall lower rates of reactivation. And if we look at the cumulative incidence, again, of CMV viremia um, stratified by either any level or at high level, and this time for the entire cohort and uh, stratified by viral load, you can see the patterns, again, slightly different for viremia at any level uh, versus high level. And one of the concerns about this approach or the study design was, well, you're only measuring CMV in blood in patients, obviously, who are alive and still hospitalized. Wouldn't you just automatically have a greater opportunity for detecting CMV in patients who are alive and still hospitalized because those are the people who you're monitoring. And we went through this uh, um, animated discussion with uh, JAMA about this for, for quite some time. And one of the lines of, of evidence that we argued was probably incompatible with that potential limitation is look at the curve. If that were true, and as I was hospitalized longer and longer and longer, I'd be tested more and more and more, I would have a greater likelihood of detecting CMV, essentially a detection sampling bias. But what you see here is those who ever reactivated CMV had done so, in fact, less than 30 days. And this curve didn't just continue to increase as I was hospitalized longer and longer. And in fact, this curve is very flat, and there were few, if any, new onset reactivation beyond 30 days after admission to the ICU. So at least in part addresses that issue about the study design. So could we identify who were the third of patients, 33% of patients who ultimately reactivated CMV? And those data are uh, shown here, uh, both in the univariate model and then in the adjusted model. And the bad news is no we were not very good at being able to predict who was ultimately going to reactivate CMV. We adjusted for all of these, or analyzed all these baseline factors. The pertinent negative here, and another concern about studies about CMV in the ICU as well, is just an expensive SED rate of the ICU, and uh, why do you need to do that to do a SED rate? It's just a marker for severity of illness. Now, there are lots of limitations in using a single severity of illness marker across the board in patients with severe uh, burns to patients with acute myocardial infarction. But given the heterogeneous population that we intentionally enrolled, um, we used that as a marker for severity of illness. And importantly, we could not demonstrate in the multivariate model any association between the sicker you were the greater the likelihood. So it seemed to at least not be solely due to severity of illness. So the meat of the analysis is what is associated with your primary endpoint of death or continued hospitalization at day 30. So we looked first at baseline factors, which are shown in this slide. And in the next slide, I'll show you the hospital stay variables as they have uh, evolved, including uh, CMV. And we found that there was a very strong association in the multivariable model with uh, patients who were admitted to the burn intensive care unit. So those patients were statistically much, much uh, more likely to be hospitalized or die by day 30. Uh, we chose a very high criterion in terms of the uh, burn surface area, in part guided by Nicole Gibran, who is the director of the burn ICU at Harborview. Um, other than, than uh, that association, we really didn't find much else that was associated with um, uh, hospitalization um, or death by day, day 30. Um, there was an associated, association multivariable model with mechanical ventilation to baseline, but remember, nearly 80% of patients in this cohort were, were uh, mechanically ventilated. 
Then we looked at what hospital stay variables were associated with uh, death or continued hospitalization. And we were relieved and, and uh, happy to find that factors that had previously been associated with death or continued hospitalization could be confirmed in this study. And specifically, developing a major nosocomial infection in multivariable analysis was associated with the endpoint. That's reassuring that the cohort is similar in some ways to what's been previously published. We found an association between uh, ventilator days and the primary endpoint, which makes sense. And then the crux here was that virtually any way we could think of to analyze CMV, and then some made up ones, there was a very strong and independent association between CMV uh, infection, active CMV infection, and the primary endpoint of death or continued hospitalization by day 30. And the odds ratios here vary depending on the specific way in which CMV was analyzed, but this relationship was very consistent, very strong, and independent. I alluded earlier to the concern of monitoring patients while they're hospitalized and not after they were discharged. So again, getting at this issue of this potential inherent bias towards detecting an association between um, length of stay and CMV was also addressed by using what's called a landmark analysis. And in this analysis, from a statistical standpoint, the, as you can see, the x-axis starts from day 30. We took the subset of patients, about 30% of, uh, of patients in the cohort, who were hospitalized at least 30 days. So all of them would have been monitored exactly the same way. And so then we could look at what the effects might be on subsequent risk for continued hospitalization or, or uh, death. And using that sort of an analysis, so everybody monitored the same, um, those who had reactivated before day 30 versus those who had not reactivated by day 30. And again, those who had reactivated earlier were at a much higher likelihood of remaining hospitalized uh, compared to those who had not previously reactivated. So at least in part addressing that concern about the study design as well. And then finally, we were interested to understand whether CMV reactivation early or later during the hospital stay could potentially have differential impacts on subsequent death or hospitalization. And we used partial proportional odds models looking at a, essentially a moving average of CMV, either a seven-day moving average or the area under the curve divided up in, in the amount of CMV that was detected and dividing by the number of days at various durations of hospitalization, and again, found a very consistent finding that CMV reactivation either early or later in the hospital stay was consistently associated with a higher subsequent risk of remaining hospitalized or dying. And we were able to model then the associations between CMV and these outcomes and demonstrate that there was a apparent dose effect, if you will, or a dose response curve such that we could calculate the uh, increased probability of hospitalization or death by day 30 as a function of how much CMV reactivation was ultimately detected in an individual patient. So these data then really confirmed in many ways and extended using more rigorous scientific methods uh, the association between reactivation and uh, various adverse outcomes. Um, at least within the limitations that I discussed, we found that uh, CMV reactivation couldn't be explained solely on the basis of illness severity, again, with, with many uh, limitations, that it was independently and quantitatively associated with prolonged hospitalization and death. But still, this very important issue comes up. Does CMV reactivation actually cause these adverse outcomes? Or is it in some way just a perfect marker in some ways for people who are destined to do poorly? So one way to think about that is, are there credible, biologically plausible mechanisms that could explain how CMV could actually cause those adverse outcomes that make sense based on preliminary data, et cetera? That might make the case a bit stronger, or at least provide some evidence that this association is not just spurious or confounded. And I think there are at least three very credible uh, mechanistic links between CMV and some of the adverse outcomes that uh, were observed in this and multiple other studies. And they're listed here, and I'll provide for you the data that uh, support each of these specific uh, uh, mechanisms. 
perhaps it's just what CMV does in immunosuppressed hosts. Maybe CMV is causing CMV pneumonia. We would never think about CMV pneumonia in the setting of a normal host who has unexplained pulmonary infiltrates in the ICU. That's just not really on the radar screen for otherwise immunocompetent patients. And I'll show you some very tantalizing data, highly uh, limited in nature, that suggests that that might actually be a potential mechanism through which CMV could mediate some of the adverse outcomes. There are pretty reasonable data suggesting that CMV might either amplify or perpetuate certain inflammatory pathways that have previously been shown to be important in some of the complications, particularly of patients who develop sepsis. And then finally, we have a body of evidence primarily from the transplant setting such suggesting that CMV might create a, set of, uh, a setting of immunosuppression such that patients who survive their initial insult might be more uh, predisposed to uh, succumbing to nosocomial infections such as uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. And there are some data to uh, suggest that that might also be in operation. So what are the data that CMV could do in ICU patients who are not immunosuppressed what we know it does in transplant patients? This was a review from uh, Nina Singh and her colleague at University of Pittsburgh where they reviewed data from uh, available studies in the ICU setting of patients who had otherwise unexplained pulmonary infiltrates were by and large not immunosuppressed. There were a few, uh, four patients included in, the, in these cohorts who actually were immunosuppressed and who underwent either autopsy or open lung biopsy and had histologic assessment of the lung for CMV inclusion, sort of the footprints of CMV pneumonia. And what they found was, was quite surprising to me that the rates of finding histologic evidence of CMV in the lung of these patients who were not immunosuppressed ranged from 18 up to 30%. And importantly, only 10 of the 100 patients in which viral culture was done was CMV detected by culture. So again, some provocative data, highly um, select group of patients, and so how broadly applicable this is, I'm not sure, but at least suggesting that this could be one mechanism if that association between CMV and these adverse outcomes were actually causal. In addition, um, there's a very nice uh, animal model, a murine model of sepsis that's called the uh, cecal ligation and puncture model where sepsis is reproducibly um, induced in a mouse, and it can be done in mice that are latently infected with CMV, so CMV seropositive mice with their own murine strain of CMV, or not infected, and that was what was done in this particular study by Chuck Cook and his colleagues. They took mice, did this procedure of cecal ligation and puncture uh, in mice that were latently infected with their own strain of CMV, and showed that in uh, previously latently infected uh, mice who were CMV positive compared to mice who were CMV negative, there were elevated levels of certain key cytokines and molecules in the lung of these uh, mice, and that the mice who were CMV infected had higher injury and fibrosis scores than mice uh, who were not CMV infected. And perhaps the, the most important finding was that these, this abnormal cytokine expression, as well as their lung injury, which they were able to quantitate, was actually able to be reduced by treating these mice with gancyclovir, I'm sure after informed consent. And their actual primary data are shown here. In this top panel, they're looking at different regimens of the antiviral drug gancyclovir and looking at its effect in preventing CMV reactivation. And again, placebo, all of the mice um, reactivated CMV using the most potent regimens up front without a delay was very effective in reducing CMV reactivation, whereas delaying uh, the onset of antiviral drug was not as effective in reducing CMV reactivation. This is a quantitation of the amount of lung injury that we're measuring in the mice um, after uh, cecal ligation and puncture. And again, the regimens that were most effective in reducing CMV reactivation were the most effective in reducing the lung injury and fibrosis scores. So again, full circle that in this specific animal model of CMV and sepsis, and uh, that they could actually reduce some of the adverse effects that they saw, particularly in the lung, through use of an antiviral uh, agent, gancyclovir. <clears throat> 
Upregulation of inflammatory pathways has also been suggested or linked to CMV. It's uh, of demonstrated relevance in, in various um, uh, adverse outcomes uh, seen in patients with severe sepsis in particular. And a couple of key cytokines, IL-6 and IL-8, uh, have been demonstrated to be closely uh, following outcomes in patients with acute lung injury and ARDS. And there are certainly links between these cytokines and CMV, as shown here. And through samples that were uh, shared uh, by Renee Stapleton, who's one of the co-investigators on the GRAIL study, which I'll show you, we were, in fact, able to demonstrate that in patients with acute lung injury in her fish oil study, that we were able to find higher levels of these cytokines in bronchoalveolar lavage fluid of samples either early or uh, during the course of acute lung injury in samples that had uh, coexisting CMV infection. And then finally, the last mechanism was C CMV-associated immunosuppression. And here, I think there's a number of epidemiologic studies, mostly in the transplant setting, that have associated CMV infection with subsequent other opportunistic infections. Again, is it a marker or causal? It's not known. But the single most uh, potent line of evidence here comes from randomized placebo-controlled trials and transplantation, where using an antiviral drug to prevent CMV was actually associated with a significantly reduced incidence of other bacterial or fungal infections using a drug that had absolutely no known antibacterial or antifungal activity. Again, in line with the hypothesis then that by preventing CMV, you might actually impact the uh, likelihood that a patient would develop other opportunistic infections. So with this model then and the available data that I've shared with you, my colleague and I have come up with uh, just sort of a, a drawing of what we think might be going on, that sepsis, pneumonia, burns, or other uh, forms of, of insults that ultimately lead to critical illness create a milieu that's very um, conducive to CMV reactivation, and that CMV reactivation then is essentially a second hit, if you will, through either direct or indirect effects that we discussed might uh, contribute to or worsen some of the clinical sequelae that are seen in those who survive the initial insult of sepsis or burn, et cetera. And importantly, that if this relationship is actually causal, which we don't know, that using an antiviral drug, as was used in the sequel ligation and puncture model, might be expected to either reduce CMV reactivation uh, to some degree and thereby impacting in a beneficial way some of the adverse outcomes that are linked with sepsis uh, in the ICU setting. So that's sort of the preliminary data uh, as it exists in the literature and, and from our group. And so the question is now we have all this tantalizing data, it's observational, is it causal or is it a perfect uh, uh, marker or confounder for, for um, outcomes? What should we do next? And I think this has been a very contentious area with some uh, experts in the field saying, well, I'm not a believer and I think we should do further observational studies. And um, although they would, in our view, never definitively answer the question, I think they would be useful for clarifying some of the endpoint sample sizes for future interventional studies. But my colleague and I, uh, Michael and I, have felt very strongly that given the huge unmet clinical need the availability of an antiviral agent that's available literally on the shelf, and some of the preliminary data that we've shared with you that a, a trial, an interventional trial, is actually feasible, warranted, and should be a priority for studies in the intensive care unit. And that's exactly uh, what we are currently doing. And that is essentially the uh, background and aims of our, our study, the GRAIL study, again, cyclovir to prevent reactivation of CMV uh, with acute injury of the lung. This is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial that is uh, fully supported by NIH and specifically NHLBI. Uh, in this study, we are enrolling patients whose primary insults leading to acute uh, illness, uh, ICU admission is either severe sepsis or trauma combined with respiratory failure. The total enrollment is 160, and this trial is ongoing now at 12 sites in the United States. Uh, it's phase two designed as a proof of principle study rather than a, a definitive efficacy study. And it's designed as prophylaxis rather than as a treatment trial. And we'll come back to that very uh, important uh, study design issue in just a minute. 
And the primary objectives really are to define feasibility, safety, antiviral effect in this setting. And uh, the primary endpoint of the study is to look at changes in IL-6 and IL-8 as the, as the primary endpoints. And then a number of exploratory endpoints looking at both short-term as well as longer-term out, uh, longer outcomes in these patients. We thought a lot about which antiviral drug to use. There are several drugs that are FDA approved and licensed, but it turns out that two of the most common uh, drugs or that have been around for the longest are simply too toxic to be used in this particular setting. And so we thought that gancyclovir, which has been FDA approved for preventing and treating CMV since 1989 in the United States, would be the, the least worst option to use in this very sick population. It comes in both intravenous and oral forms and is relatively well tolerated, although it does have important toxicities, which I'll cover in this next slide. Uh, this drug has been around, so we sort of know, uh, know the enemy in this case. And we have human data for a number of adverse effects that have been described um, and uh, what uh, specific uh, adverse effects have been documented in randomized trials. And really, the primary issue is hematologic toxicity and specifically neutropenia. And our estimates based on available data is that that would occur no more than 2% uh, over the rates that we would see in the placebo arm. And in the 70 patients enrolled to date, we have not yet encountered a, a patient with neutropenia. Uh, gancyclovir is also known to be a potent teratogen in uh, mice and other animal studies. And so strict precautions to prevent pregnancy and is, is an important uh, consideration in this uh, particular trial. So which antiviral strategy to use? I showed you that only 30% of patients reactivated CMV. If you used a trial that uh, included giving everybody the drug who was CMV seropositive, you're essentially going to expose two-thirds of patients who would have never reactivated CMV and would therefore, uh, according to this argument, have been at risk for CMV-associated complications. The other possibility is to use a treatment approach where you would monitor people at the first detection of CMV, only then intervene with an antiviral drug. And we struggled with this issue uh, from a study design perspective um, and ultimately came down uh, on the uh, side of using a prophylactic strategy because we felt that the potential advantages of this approach outweighed um, the uh, cons here, at least for early clinical trials, despite the fact that any effect of gancyclovir might be diluted by the fact that a significant proportion of people would ultimately be treated and not have been at risk or never reactivated CMV. So the study design, in a way, is fairly straightforward. Patients who are uh, CMV seropositive have severe sepsis or severe trauma and associated respiratory failure are randomized within five days of, of admission to the intensive care unit once they're shown to be CMV seropositive. Um, they are randomized then in a one-to-one -one fashion to either intravenous gancyclovir or matching IV placebo. And then when feasible, they are switched to the corresponding oral uh, formulation. And patients are monitored very closely for a number of safety parameters, uh, clinical parameters, cytokines, uh, CMV excretion in multiple body sites. And importantly, patients are followed not just for the traditional 28 days this is done or had been done for many uh, ICU studies, but actually, since we think uh, that the effects of CMV might not be manifest till several weeks or months after reactivation, that the actual time frame for the study includes late onset follow-up up to six months uh, after admission and randomization. The study, as I mentioned, is um, active at, at 12 different sites in the United States. This shows the enrollment to date. Um, we are... Um, had encountered some problems uh, with enrollment, and enrollment had slowed quite a bit. We made some changes in the inclusion-exclusion criteria to facilitate enrollment, and that has led, fortunately, to some improvements, but we're still struggling uh, very hard to try and get the study fully enrolled. So in summary then, I think hopefully I've convinced you that CMV reactivation in immunocompetent but critically ill patients is actually fairly common and that within the constraints of the analyses that have been done, that it does appear to be associated, at least epidemiologically, with adverse outcomes. There are some very biologically plausible mechanisms that could um, be associated or, or demonstrate a, a causal link between CME and these adverse outcomes. 
but certainly uh, causality would, would be something that's simply not possible, in my view, with observational studies, and that there's an ongoing trial that at least in part will tease apart this relationship between CMV and the adverse outcomes in the intensive care unit. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people that have been instrumental in, uh, in making this uh, GRAIL study go, as well as some of the other preliminary studies. My very close uh, colleague, uh, Michael Burke uh, at Fred Hutch, who's the co-PI uh, with me on this uh, uh, GRAIL study. The Statistical Data Coordinating Unit, uh, Thula and Eileen Hess. Uh, the Central Laboratory, which will soon start analyzing samples from the study. Um, Tony and Ying, the statisticians based at Sharp at Fred Hutch. Uh, a very supportive uh, program officer at NHLBI, Andrea Harabin. Um, a very lively and strongly opinionated uh, DSMB led by Taylor Thompson uh, at Mass General. Uh, the steering committee consisting of Michael, myself, uh, Gordon Rubenfeld, and uh, Renee Stapleton. Um, several other key members of the coordinating site. Um, pulmonary colleagues without whom it would have been impossible to even think about uh, designing a study in the intensive care unit setting. And then finally, two very dedicated research uh, coordinators who have been in the trenches working very hard uh, to enroll patients in this study. And then finally, to all of the uh, GRAIL site investigators at each of the 12 sites who uh, hopefully will continue to be supportive of the trial and, and help, uh, help us reach our accrual goals uh, at the end of 2014. All right, I thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. No. Oh. So the question was, why weren't patients with burns included? And I think they, as I showed you, had the highest rates of CMV reactivation of all the critically ill patients. And this was more uh, related to logistical uh, and uh, considerations rather than anything else. And in fact, we are now designing a trial specifically in burn patients uh, through a different mechanism through the Department of Defense uh, um, funding mechanism. But yeah, I agree, they had the highest rates and perhaps would be the, the group that, that the effects of CMV might be uh, most plausible based on available data. Um, I'd, I'd like to suggest a, another potential mechanism um, you know, and that could be examined. And in the sort of sepsis ARDS multiple organ failure world, there's a lot of interest and if they will activation dysfunction. In fact, there was an NHLBI conference that you know, said that we've been misguided in terms of our efforts looking at inflammation, blah, 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 and that they actually act, uh, endothelial activation and dysfunction plays a major role. And we have a lot of data that um, you know, endothelial activation dysfunction plays a major role in multiple organ failure, ARDS. There's also a body of literature that implicates CMV infection in endothelial activation dysfunction. You could test this to see in your sepsis population whether or not the reactivation is associated with more endothelial activation dysfunction in the samples that you have in some of the assays that we do. That's one side of it. That's one thing. The other thing is potentially there's also um, interest that really it's not the acute inflammatory phase of sepsis which causes mortality. It's really this immunosenescent sort of phase. And that means uh, that you have T cell apoptosis, B cell apoptosis, et cetera. You could look in your populations to see if you have senescent T cells that are associated with CMV reactivation quite easily with uh, some flow cytometries like type studies for PD1, et cetera. Those would be, I think, plausible mechanisms that would sort of combine CMV mechanisms with what we now understand about sepsis and multiple organ failure, rather than some of the more conventional things up there, just like inflammation or something like that. Those are excellent suggestions, and, and again, built into this study because uh, you know while we have the opportunity long before we know if, if we're actually suppressing CMV even has some inkling of potential clinical benefit, we do have um, high quality samples that will be saved that will be available for these sorts of analyses. Thanks for those suggestions. Excellent talk, uh, Ajit. Uh, I think it's very exciting the, the findings, and uh, as you know, transplantation. Uh, 
pretty much all brain dead donors are in this critical care scenario. So I have a couple of questions. One, uh, in the medical ICU type patients where there are any severely, just severely neurologically damaged patients without pneumonia or, or uh, trauma uh, or that were even brain dead, just uh, to see whether just the, the brain death itself uh, could potentiate this. And the second question is, um, you know, you mentioned lung as uh, a common area for CMV, but also the intestine is also a common area for CMV. And when you look at skin and burns, these are all uh, entry sites for the innate immune system. Uh, did you, do you have any speculation about that uh, activation of the innate immune system and then its relationship with the adaptive immune system? In this, uh, in this clinical situation. Wow, those are uh, pretty deep <laughs> comments and questions. I, I can tell you that in the entry criteria for the trial, let me take your first uh, point that you made about brain death donors. I don't think in this particular study, in the observational study, we included patients who were brain dead. One of the exclusion criteria was anticipated to, to die within 72 hours of withdrawal of care because of uh, severe neurologic uh, trauma. So I don't think we'll be able to look back at that. But I think your point about other sites where CMV is well known to, to uh, be active or latent um, and where there would be crosstalk with innate immune systems like the gut is, is very important. Um, for the purposes of the GRAIL study, we haven't built in, uh, unfortunately, any ways to be able to assess some of the, or interrogate some of those pathways, for example, in the gut. We would be able to look at some of these issues in the lung, but unfortunately not the gut. But I agree with your, your comments that those would be uh, important issues to consider uh, in terms of CMV reactivation um, in, in this sort of a setting. Andrew, my, my question is sort of similar to Conrad's question, and that is, has to do with the use of the of, of immune competent. And are, are these folks actually immune competent at the time that they enter the ICU, either by virtue of a subclinical immune incompetence that wasn't known, or of the trauma, or you know, a burn, or whatever they they had? And and, and it, that would be consistent with burn patients um, being the ones with highest reactivation. And I'm wondering if. You know, you're, you're rightly thinking of CMV as a second hit that's complicating everything, but whether you could tease some first hit so you could maybe predict who's more likely to reactivate CMV based on some sort of immunologic assessment at the time of um, event. Yeah, Jan, that's a very important point. One of the great limitations and disappointments was not really being able to identify a specific group that we could say, gosh, if you have this based on epidemiologic criteria, for example, that you had an 80% chance of reactivating CMV, as you could imagine, for any interventional trial, that would have been the group to specifically do this sort of trial in. Um, you know, I think what's been looked at in previous studies in terms of adaptive immunity hasn't really provided much in, in terms of uh, specific adaptive immune markers, CMV-specific CD8s that are activated, et cetera, that seem to predict. And I think part of it may be related to the time frame of CMV reactivation in the ICU setting. As I showed you, the earliest onset was four days and sort of the median was 10 to 12 days. So in terms of thinking about adaptive immune responses in someone who was previously CMV infected however many decades ago, it may be that other innate immunity uh, markers, other sorts of pathways might be more operative here than, than classical sort of T cell immunity as we think about for viral infections. But um, defining laboratory markers, objective laboratory markers that predict CMV reactivation in this setting is obviously a very high priority since that would help to to define the specific group in whom studies would probably be most uh, logical to, to perform. Yeah. The, the concept of, of latency and then reactivation in the setting of some sort of immunosuppressive hit holds true for all members of the herpes virus family. Um, and are you looking or thinking of looking at uh, the, the other multiple herpes viruses in this setting? <laughs> Yeah, you're right, and, and some of the, the key features, latency, reactivation, are in fact shared by other members of the herpes virus family, and fortuitously, uh, Paula Lopez, who's a postdoc working with us, 
Um, her uh, specific project is looking at other herpes viruses and specifically HHV6 since it's so closely related to CMV and see if the factors that lead to CMV reactivation are similar or not to those that uh, lead to reactivation of HHV6 in this setting. So that work is already underway using samples uh, from this uh, prospective cohort. 